most famous rock club in, you know, in the world. We're outside number 90 Wardle Street, the old entrance to the Market Club. The famous sticky floors, the repulsive toilets, and friends we all made for life. Well, everybody played there apart from the Beatles. Everybody. Because it was a place to play in London, it's where all your favourite bands played. So if you was a music fan, you wanted to play it because you'd seen all your favourite bands there. And it was just real and it was basic. But it's what the aura that came out of it. It was just a friendly, easy place to go to. No airs and braces, sticky carpet, you know, pound a pint, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's, I think that's why it was so popular. But there's literally nothing of that kind of scene for, for you know, smaller bands to start and bigger bands to come and play little gigs there. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think it's really sad. That's, this is why people still remember it, because I, I think literally there's been nothing like it since. It's like whatever you're into, you know, there's landmarks of like musical, I mean we're talking real history here of the, you know, the groundbreaking bands through the 60s into the 70s who then, you know, some went on to be huge and it was just, it's just a little mecca, you know, some things have, have their X factor of why, but you know, it, you know, you think you've seen the who there, you know, when the, when the, when they ripped it out, if someone had some thought, you know, if I was the builder, I would have kept the stage. I mean, you imagine the DNA that's in that stage. The Marquee Club in London has been heralded as iconic because of the sheer number of successful acts that played there. It was started in 1958 in Oxford Street by Harold Pendleton, moving to Wardour Street in 1964 and Charing Cross Road in 1988. It had an impact on music lovers. Did it have an impact on the music scene itself? Looking back might give us an insight into what made it so special and whether those days are lost forever. It seemed to be full every night. It seemed to be everyone I know down there. And I was dying to play it and eventually we did play it. When I came down from Glasgow and I'd known it as the legendary marquee and you'd see all these bands you know in sounds and stuff that were playing there and I remember first joining Bank of Monterey which was really the, for the, those few years which are the marquee years but I think we might have even been called Empire with a Y at that one point and we supported um, Becky and the Bombshells at the Border Street marquee and I think Dust, Dumpy's Rusty Nuts as well and a few things like that and then we had this crazy summer where we did the two, two of the three Guns N' Roses the first gigs. I used to work at Reading Rock Festival and uh, backstage and I, I met a, a guy there who uh, worked at the Wardour Street venue So and he used to work on the back door. So um, I used to, me and my friends, we used to, uh, by his direction, go through the NCP car park next door and climb over quite a high wall, drop down and then he'd be there to you know, meet us and he'd let us all in for nothing. Baz Ward, a road manager for over 50 years, started going to the Marquee in the 60s and began working with English band The Nice in 1967. They'd had a residency at the Marquee prior to a tour in America and played again on their return. We broke the house record and that never be broken because not long after that they built the bar because there didn't used to be a bar in the Marquee. They didn't build a bar till 69. And then when the nice split, I did uh, Eric Clapton's band, Derek and the Dominoes. And he did the marquee doing two shows. And uh, my kid brother came down from Liverpool. 
and he, he saw this scruffy geezer carrying this guitar and he said, what's he doing carrying the guitar? I said, that's God, that's himself. And there was two shows and in between the shows I went to the gents and there were two guys lying on the balls on the top of the gents trying to get in for the second show. But they didn't. The first time I played the marquee was, I think I was 17. I guess like 1986 and that was supporting uh, the Queer Boys, the band called the Queer Boys and uh, I'd, I'd played in my uh, hometown supporting the Queer Boys and uh, and they really liked my band which was called the Cradle Snatchers, <laughs> unbelievably right? But we were 16, there was a bit of irony to it. call from a guy called Adrian Purser who was a uh, Queer Boys agent or you was know, looking after the guys. He said, do you want to play in London? And I was like, London, yeah. Marquee, and it was like, I mean, it was, that, was, that was kind of beyond what we'd even thought about, you know what I mean? We're from Bed Bedford, you know what I mean? No one in Bedford ever gets to play the Marquee. That, that was, it was a big thing, you know? I moved to London in 1987, but I, you know, I've been, you know, with my pals. You know, we cook, used to go down to London, you know, for weekends, just get, you know, drunk, and you know, it didn't matter who was on the marquee, you know, you had to go to the marquee. But when I moved here, I uh, a friend of mine uh, worked in the business, and she she says, oh, this band White Lion are playing at the, uh, the marquee with tickets. I says, oh, great. So I went down early, and the choir boys were supporting. Right, you know, I'd never heard them, never seen them, and I remember going home to the, the house share that I had with my band, the Red Dogs. I says, I've just seen the best band I've ever seen in my life, you know, and all these years later. <laughs> The Marquee was a meeting place for performers and those involved with live music, a network formed around it for the musical community and its fans, including nearby bars and clubs like The Ship and the St Moritz. But I mean, all of those bars and the Marquee, they were like the same thing, you know, The Ship, the, then The George, obviously, when it was the Charing Cross one. It was just the same people, it was the same scene, so you just felt like you were part of this world which is really really nice at the time you know well, i bumped into fish there a few times because fish was a fair regular touring uh who else used to be there a lot ozzy geezer yeah. battler noddy holder all in one night so stories you know with noddy and ozzy at the bar were something to behold if i could remember them they'd probably be libelous and i couldn't tell them out loud anyway that was pretty impressive you never knew who you were standing next to so you could be standing next to Gary Moore or somebody like that um, and then behind you could be a journalist and next to you could be an A&R man you know it was one of those places where uh, it, it, the people made it I think. The marquee was a club and you were part of the club and you, know, you could stand and talk to Long John Baldry and not have any apostles you know. or with Keith Moon or Keith Richard there was no superstars can't you be a superstar, you know? I mean, the guy you're talking to, oh, he's a drummer with the who. You know, it doesn't matter. The marquee was in a central position in London, not just among bars, but also Denmark Street just up the road, famous for new and second-hand musical instruments. But this wasn't its only benefit. Being in Wardour Street, uh, was the best place it could ever be uh, because of being surrounded by agents, managers, record companies. There were so many within a throw, stone's throw. The actual 
thing about the marquee was the building as well. It was the if you could find a perfect gig for a band to play, it was the perfect size stage for a five or even more piece band. It was a perfect size for what we were allowed, 400 people, but I never really stuck to that, but I can say that now because the fire officer don't know where I live. The size of it, the acoustics were perfect because the ceiling was a perfect height. You never really had a bad sound. It was just the perfect room uh, to showcase a band for a record company. It, it really was the best place to uh, go if a record, record company was uh, interested in you. Intimacy did play a, a big part in that because you could actually touch the bands and things like that and nobody really cared. It was all one big, it seemed like a one big happy family sort of a gig because everybody got to know everybody at the time in the 80s anyway and the contact with the band and the crowd made the crowd react as though they're a, they're a part of the band. So they would go and buy albums as soon as these people had got a product out, they'd be there buying it. But the intimacy and uh, the heat, I mean, I remember Fish standing on stage once and he just said, he looked around and he said, look, he said, the walls are sweating. And it really was, it was just condensation, uh, just dribbling down the walls. Finding small bands and building them was more to the marquee's tradition for me than booking the big bands. But when I started booking the bands in the mid 80s, I changed the booking policy. There was a policy where a band could only be booked by an agent or an agency. Well, to me, that you had a lot of young bands coming through who didn't have anything. And most of the young lads were on the dole as well you know that so they were up against it so i cut all that out and i just if i liked a band i booked them and i rebooked them and i kept pushing and pushing until they actually done something like wolfsbane they were a little band from dudley who needed a hand namely one was a, a band called the choir boys who uh, when they first arrived on the scene they were thought to be scruffy and noisy but I like them. I thought they were nice, they were polite, um, had a raw sound as well, and it was an old English style of rock and roll. So I kept on um, pushing them until they eventually headlined, sold out, a couple of nights sold out, put them on the Reading Festival a couple of times. The next time I saw them after that was in the Tokyo Dome, supporting uh, John Bon Jovi. <laughs> The, the first time I, I remember we'd done two nights of sorting it out and I remember coming round in the queue up to the ship and I thought, oh my god, that's, that's incredible, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Payday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In 1987 there was a band who had never taught the UK before and they had a bad reputation. Would they play the marquee? I was told not to book them by more than one person because they carry guns, they take drugs, they drink a lot. There's always lots of violence going on. So I booked them for three nights and uh, that was Guns N' Roses. It was a strange booking because I booked them for three nights in a space of 10 days, a uh, Monday, a Friday, and a Sunday. We did the first and the last, and Little Angels did the, the second one. Someone sent me a, a poster, and it was two nights Guns N' Roses. I'm on the same poster supporting Tiger Tales. So, so I'm like, there's me on, on the same poster, Choir Boys, Guns N' Roses. 
and they were rehearsing at John Henry's where I, where I was working and they went down and were doing the marquee and I said well you need to get in there you know round about three o'clock because you can't get round the back because all the cars will be parked up so they went down and of course they hadn't eaten so whoever was would have decided to take them for a curry and they'd never had a curry before so you can imagine this the state of the dressing room was just full of vomit. <laughs> they were throwing up all over the place. <laughs> it was crazy. You know? Things like that stick in your mind, you know. The first one was bizarre because they weren't famous yet and they came over and it was rammed out just from the, the pre publicity. And people didn't really like it. They got a terrible review in Kerrang! Really famously, they got slagged off. And then they, they did the second one with, with Little Angels and the third one was like a Sunday night and it wasn't even sold out. When they'd done the Sunday night gig, they came off the stage, Slash was being sick in the sink, Axel was flat out on the floor and so when I came backstage and all the crowd are going nuts waiting for you know more songs to be sung and I just get up off that floor you Yankee pussy and get back on that stage and they did and it was great. But for some reason they were being really arsy to us and they sound checked literally up until the time that the, the doors opened. Well actually not really sound checked, Slash just stood in the stage and just messed around until the doors were open. And then so we couldn't get a sound check, so we just had to chuck our gear up and then sound check when the people were coming in. And then after we played they threw all our stuff out of the dressing room and it was just they were really, really arsy to us. And then our bass player let down the tires of their tour bus. <laughs> which was parked outside the market. <laughs> and then we scarpered, because I remember I was at the bar, I just chanted to someone, and they go, we've got to go and go, why? We've just let down our tires, we've got to go. <laughs> so we all just jumped in whatever and, and buggered off, you know, so. And then, you know, a month later or something, the album came out and we were all like, God, it's really good, isn't it? And in about 18 months, they became the biggest rock band in the world at that time. Only one year later, the beloved marquee in Wardour Street had to close. The building was beyond repair and condemned. New premises were found on Charing Cross Road. It would be a larger venue on a busier street, had it lost some of its charm. We closed on the 31st of July 1988 and we opened Charing Cross Road on August the 16th. I did book an opening act for um, Charing Cross Road, uh, quite a big one actually, and Jack Barry was going nuts because I wouldn't tell him who it was. Now, he was the boss, he was the managing director, but I had an agreement with the agent, John Jackson, and the band, and we were the only people that knew who was gonna play the opening night of Charing Cross Road. But, so I had to tell Jack about a week before because I'd already rang uh, Jeff Barton at Kerrang, um, Carol Clark, Melody Maker, Valerie Potter at Metal, um, Metal Hammer and told them it was going to be Kiss. So that's who it was and it was, it was quite a big night and as for it being a secret, well it wasn't really, not because Kerrang put it inside front page and things like that. But I wanted it to be busy and get lots of publicity. The capacity doubled, more than doubled in Charing Cross Road. That was what I thought was going to be a problem for finding new bands because you can't be a new band and play in front of 850 people. No, I didn't like that new D, much Charlie Cross. It's, uh, it wasn't the same atmosphere, you know. The marquee in Charing Cross Road eventually closed in 1996. The site is now Weatherspoon's pub, which ironically does not play any music at all. The music industry and the landscape for live music has undergone many changes over the years. Gentrification of urban areas in London and other cities has been blamed for a major reduction in small to mid-sized venues. I always imagine some guy in an office somewhere that knows nothing about anything apart from, you know, zeros and ones, making these decisions that can just, you know, take away 50 years of culture because he can make an extra 10 grand a year selling this on as a flat or as a restaurant or whatever with just no respect and as you say it's you know it's just like it's decay because they have no respect that this industry is one of the biggest industries in the world you know 
and they don't realise they're just crippling it for these bands who just cannot get the chance to build up a, a following, you know, whether it's around the country, that you know, it's all disappearing, but it all starts in the pubs, you know, the, I can't really think of many people that, that didn't, you know, get doing that craft, and the pubs are disappearing, so, you know, where does the live music go? And, you know, I lived in London for 26 years, and it was just marvellous. You go into the West End and the whole scene and all the bands and the fans and, you know, everybody putting their flyers out and... It was just, it was just a completely magic time, you know? So, uh, it's a real shame, but what can you do, you know? The decrease in places to play is not the only modern drawback for musicians. Younger musicians understand really their attitudes changed because they've grown up with the internet and, you know, social media. I mean, you know, when I was 16, 17, you know, the thought of making a video, you know, you would save up forever to go to someone's shed to make your demo. You know, if you've got an iPad now, you can do it. So. I'm, you know, I don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing, you know, I think it's a good thing because the technology is there for people to work with, but it's it's taken the struggle away, not that I want people to struggle, but it's like any apprenticeship, you know, you just don't walk into it, you know, without having to graft for it, because when, you're, when the chips are down you don't know how to graft. You know, it's like a band like us, you know, you know, my age, it's our age, the, the touring is gruelling. You know, and you, you know, you always get people say, oh, it must be easy for you. I will say, spend a month with us. But that's from 40 years of doing it. You know, if you just wandered in now, it would kill you. New bands, they can, they can get like a million followers, but what does it equate to? It doesn't equate to anything, does it? It's not. It's, it's not something you can actually. It's not quantifiable. Is that the word? Yeah. It's. it's yeah. You can't actually prove that it actually means anything. The only thing that means anything is that every time you go back to a venue, there's more people watching you, coming to see you. From pubs to clubs, modern small music venues have had to diversify, putting on cover and tribute bands to survive. So where do we are in Southport? Everybody goes on about the good old days, but that's what they are, good old days. Everything has to change. It's You can't keep relying on them same people from 20 years ago to still come into the pub. And that's what, that's that's the problem. You re, people rely on the past to keep a venue going, and it doesn't. You've got to keep moving with the times. In my opinion, it's, we've done it with Avenue, you, you reinvent yourself every couple of years. Um, we're fairly small, we're about, uh, capacity is about 120. Uh, we don't charge to come in, so it's all um, free for anyone to access. Um, we do live music five nights a week. The Sad Lim puts on tribute bands every week, but Lee wanted to help original bands too. He created a new venue out of old stables next to his pub. Basically, they rent the venue for free, and I give them a bar member as well to run the bar for them, um, and take ticket money on the door. They get 100% of the door for the band, and I also give them 15% of the G21 bar. So concentrating on delivering the best, and if we can deliver the best we can, and the customers come in, and we've got a queue down the street to get in the venue, we're doing something right. The place could be a right dive, or it could be the best place, the best looking place in, in the world. But if it's not got that buzz and that vibe and nice friendly atmosphere. 
an organisation was set up by Sybil Bell in 2013 to champion and help preserve independent music venues. At Independent Venue Week, we are there to shine a spotlight and on and celebrate the hundreds of venues all around the country that give artists their first opportunity to learn to play live music. But it's not just the artists, it's about people who want to work in the live music industry's crew. So somebody that wants to be a lighting engineer or a sound engineer or a tour manager, the best place for them to learn their craft is also in these small spaces. We hope that events like this, like Independence Day, is a chance for people to come together and exchange ideas. So venues who've been working with us or been around for a really long time, talking to younger venue owners and operators and sharing their thoughts and experiences and the younger venues also sharing their experiences with some of the older venues who may be slightly more used to a way of doing things and, and maybe not aware of some of the new opportunities that are there. The other area that really people don't talk enough about is how important these venues are in their local community. It's really important to have a cultural hub not just for live mu music and arts but also for learning and for culture. When people go to live music venues, they look at what other people are wearing and they talk about, they're aware of fashion and they're aware of um, arts in a wider sense. You're looking at posters and flyers, so there's visual arts. And it's just a really great place for people to meet and congregate in real life rather than social media. I think what makes an iconic venue beyond just the artists is the staff who care, where a venue is really well run and people are well looked after and it's, it's busy all the time with gig goers. It doesn't need to be about profile or numbers or fame or fortune, it needs to be somewhere that's really valued in the community. You can go to the same gig in the same venue, watch the same band with the same audience, two nights on the trot and they will be completely different nights and I think that's the magic. Many small music venues have been lost, including the unique and legendary Marquee Club where the musical community would come together. Small venues offer an intimate atmosphere that creates an amazing experience for the audience and performer. Even though times change, the memories last and the music plays on. It was good fun. It was a moment in time, if you know. I never, ever, ever did to get it. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> pretty Taylor was bored, wasn't he? No, but so was I. Did you get bored? Yeah. Did you get bored? Nah, it wasn't fun. I'm a good lad. Before.